this will be like a short presentation about uh, the spirometry and uh, in this presentation I will focus on the flow volume curves. I mentioned these when we talked about the airway resistance. Uh, uh, volume flow curves are useful in determining airway resistance and they will help us also to differentiate between uh, restrictive and uh, obstructive lung diseases. Uh, the lung volumes and capacities we have discussed, I have described in detail in lecture number three. So please go and uh, read them. So I will just uh, with the, the lung volumes with, uh, obtained with the spirometry. This is the spirogram. We define what the tidal volume is and uh, the value of the tidal volume. And then if you take a deep inspiration, you take a volume known as the inspiratory reserve and then you breathe normally and then uh, you take forceful exhalation and this will give you the expiratory reserve. If you take the tidal volume and then you, ins you take a deep breath followed by a forceful expiration, uh, you will uh, basically breathe what's known as the vital capacity. Now, once you know the lung volumes, basically there is the tidal volume, the inspiratory reserve, and expiratory reserve. Uh, these volumes are the ones which can be measured using spirometer. What's left in the lung after forceful exhalation, which is a residual volume, which is about 1,200 ml, uh, this cannot be measured. And accordingly, uh, with a spirometer, you can measure the tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve. And uh, from these volumes, you can measure what's known as uh, inspiratory capacity, which is known as the, which is equal to inspiratory reserve plus the tidal volume, and expiratory capacity, if you want to call it, uh, which is equal to the tidal volume plus the forceful exhalation. And uh, then we have the functional residual capacity where we usually start the breathing from, which is equal to the expiratory reserve plus the residual volume. The vital capacity is equal to the tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve. And the total lung capacity will be equal to the functional residual capacity plus the residual volume. And we talked about the expected changes, for example, in restrictive lung diseases, where the vital capacity decreases, the residual volume decreases, and the total lung capacity decreases, whereas in obstructive lung disease, particularly in emphysema, you expect you have a larger total lung capacity due to air trapping and the increase in the residual volume. And then uh, we talked about the residual volume to total lung capacity ratio. This is a normal individual. It's about 0.25% or 25% because uh, the residual volume is about 1.2 liters and the total lung capacity is about uh, you know, 5 liters or 6 liters. So if you take this, this ratio, it becomes about 25%. Uh, now, uh, if you have an elevated uh, residual volume to total lung capacity ratio due to the increase in the residual volume, uh, then uh, this may suggest that you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and actually this occurs in emphysema, whereas if you have an elevated residual volume to total lung capacity ratio, that suggests a restrictive lung disease. Now this is actually what the spirogram. Now you can see here, you can measure the inspiratory vital capacity if you want to call it, where the volume of air in the lung after forceful inhalation will be equal to the inspiratory reserve, tidal volume, and expiratory reserve. We did another maneuver where you ask the subject to breathe from uh, the, to exhale, to, he will inhale submaximally and then he will exhale as much as he can and as quickly as possible. And then we get what's known as the force vital capacity. The force vital capacity in terms of value is equal to this 
vital capacity measured by a spirometer, just the maneuver, the maneuver is different. And then we focused on FEV1, which is the volume of air that's expired after one second. And another test you do here, as you can see, we measure the volume and we relate the change in the lung volume with time, okay? And that is why when we measure the force vital capacity, we refer to it as timed force vital capacity. At times, we measure a different thing where you, we, you measure the flow at different lung volumes, measure the flow, this is the air flow, and this is the lung volume, and you get this type of curves, and these are known as the flow volume curves. So one, which we have discussed previously, measures the, the volume of air that can be expired or inspired versus time. In this case, we measure the volume of air, the flow rate, how much air is flowing out of the lung, at different lung volumes. So if you switch curve here, you can see the volume flow curves measure basically the flow rate at different lung volumes. Now, what you do here, you can see that there are two loops. This is the inspiratory loop, and this is the expiratory loop. And you can see here that the peak expiratory flow, which is about 10 liter per second, for example, occurs at early on. And this portion basically detects the airway resistance in the large airways. And then after you breathe about 25% of the total lung capacity, you get here a, a smaller flow. As in other words, you start to expire, you get a very high flow and you reach a point known as the peak expiratory flow. And then you breathe more and more out of your lungs and then the lung volume gets smaller. So here we start from the total lung capacity and we breathe out. The peak flow rate is here. And then you can see as long, uh, when you start breathing during the test, you can see that the flow rate declines at lower lung volumes until the flow rate gets to be zero here. And I mentioned these like uh, uh, maximum flow rate at 25%, that represents the flow rate when you have expired 25% of your uh, vital capacity and uh, big expiratory flow at uh, uh, 75 and uh, at uh, 50 percent of the vital capacity and this is the flow rate at 75 percent of the vital capacity i think this portion of the curve particularly this value here is important because if there is a change here it detects airway obstruction small airway obstruction so the here, the, if there is a change here, or this side of the curve basically indicates the resistance in the upper airways, in this side of the curve, early on it detects the resistance at uh, medium sized airways, and here it, it detects the airway resistance at the small airways. And this is, of course, the inspiratory loop. Now you can see the inspiratory loop is different. I mean, and uh, is it, it's effort dependent to some extent. The larger the effort, the larger the amount of air that you can get inside your lung. And you can see this is this point here is the residual volume. And this one here represents the total lung capacity. And the difference between the total lung capacity and the residual volume is basically the vital capacity. And this loop represents the breathing pattern inhalation followed by exhalation and during tidal breathing, during tidal breathing. So this is shown here to compare the two things here. This is the force vital capacity test. You can see the peak expiratory flow is represented by the slope of this curve. And this is the volume of the, this is the volume of air that can be expired at different times.
and remember this is the force vital capacity and we usually measure the, the volume of air that's expired after one second of EV1. Now this guy here I just talked about here, this is the flow volume curve. We have an inspiratory limb and we have an expiratory limb. The early portion you have very fast air flow and you get to a peak here, peak expiratory flow rate and it start to decline as we go down and the, as as we breathe more air and the volume of air in the lung gets smaller. So at the residual volume right here, the flow is zero. And this is the total lung capacity. So at the total lung capacity, we start breathing forcefully. And then you get this flow rate. It's very high till you get to the peak. It start to decline, decline and decline until we get to the residual volume where airway, airway obstruction is likely to have and even if we make air of more effort to get more to get more air out of our this is just to remind you of the force vital capacity test this is i said said this is this in this test you ask the patient to take a deep breath and he will he will he will exhale as forcefully as possible and, and as quickly as possible and we measure the change in the lung volume versus time so you can see the, the peak flow or the maximum amount, the maximum volume of air gets early on. In other words, there is a large amount of air that leaves the that leaves the lung until we get to the vital capacity where there will be no further air flow. And you can see if the vital capacity here is about five, and you measure the volume of air that the patient exhaled after one second, you get the FEV1, which is about four. And if you measure the FEV1 to the vital capacity ratio, it's going to be about 80%. This is important because this value will change in both obstructive and... Now let's go to the volume of lung diseases. This is the normal pattern. This is the force vital capacity. This is, the, this is just the same curve. It's, 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 it's flipped over. You can switch it over. You can imagine flipping it over. It will look similar to the previous curve. This is a normal value. Now you can see in obstruction, there is a reduction in the force vital capacity, but the reduction in the FEV1 is worse. So when you take the ratio, gets to be way less than the normal 80%. Of course, this value will vary depending on the degree of obstruction. If you take uh, a person with restrictive lung disease for one reason or the other, then you can see both of them, there is a decline in both the FEV1 and the vital capacity. But the decline here is a proportional. In other words, when you take the ratio between FEV1 and the force vital capacity, could be similar or closely similar to the normal or even slightly larger. Let's talk about uh, flow volume loops. It's, it's the same. This is the inspiratory loop flow. When somebody starts breathing from the residual volume and then he takes a deep breath until he fills his lung. So this position or this volume of the lung is assumed to be the residual volume, which is about 1.2 liter. When you take a very deep breath, you will fill the lung up to the total lung capacity. And then now you can see that the, uh, the flow during inspiration is effort dependent. I mean, if you make less effort, then it's unlikely that you will reach the total lung capacity. After, anyways, after the person breathe to you know, forcefully, if he takes a deep inhalation, as much air as he can, we assume that the volume of air in his lung is equal to the total lung capacity. And you ask the patient to breathe uh, forcefully and as quickly as possible, and you measure the flow rate. So this is the flow rate. And then you can see early on, there is a large flow rate till you reach a peak known as the peak expiratory flow, which is about eight liters per second. And then, after this peak flow, you can see that the rate of flow of air from the lungs start to decline until it reaches to zero. And at this point, you have exhaled as much as possible.
and what's left in the lung is the residual volume. Uh, now, as far as uh, the flow here, you can see there is high flow because there is low resistance, and this apparently indicates the flow of air in the large airways. And after you breathe about 25% of your vital capacity, which is the difference between the total lung capacity and the residual volume here, you can see it start to decline. So this component or this portion of the curve probably measures the airway resistance in the medium-sized airways. And then when you measure like for 50, after you exhale 50% of the vital capacity uh, and you measure the, the air flow, it is going to even decline further and further. And then when there is little bit of air, uh, left in the lung or after you breathe 75% of the vital capacity it decreases further until we reach a point of zero. So this portion of the care, particularly when you measure the flow rate at 50% of the vital capacity, is the one which is seriously impaired in, uh, when there is an increase in airway resistance. Now, look at this here. You can see there are some questions here. What's the residual volume? We said that we don't measure the residual volume at all, but we assume we start breathing from the residual volume, and the residual volume is here about 1.2 liters. If you take the total lung capacity, it's going to be from like 1.2 all the way to 6 liters, almost, or 5.8 liters. And if you take the vital capacity, it's going to be the difference between the total lung capacity and the residual volume, which is going to be equal about uh, uh, 300. Uh, it's going to be equal about 4.6 liters. That's the vital capacity. This is the total lung capacity, and this is the residual volume. And again, this is just theoretical measurements. It's not going to be measured by this maneuver when you take in deep inhalation and you ask the patient to breathe and measure the flow rate uh, of uh, air out of the through the airways okay this is just a theoretical assumption we assume this is the residual volume this is the total lung capacity the difference between them is the vital capacity this is 1.2 this is about 5.8 liter and uh, Ford's vital capacity is about 4.6 liter, which is the difference between the residual volume and the total lung capacity. Now, you see this point here. You can see this point. This point here at the peak of the curve, at the peak of the expiratory flow curve, this is known as the peak expiratory flow, meaning that the flow rate increases until it peaks up, it reaches a maximum, and this is known as the peak expiratory flow. Now, if you measure the peak expiratory flow from the curve, now, as you can see, again, I want to emphasize this. This diagram relates the flow rate, it's not the volume, like we did with FEV1. In FEV1, we measure the volume of air that being exhaled forcefully versus time. Here we are measuring the flow rate at different lung volumes, and that's why we call them volume flow curve or flow volume loops. Okay, so this point represents the peak expiratory flow rate, peak expiratory flow rate, and you can see from the curve you are given uh, three choices here, but the peak is here. It's about eight liters per second, and again I said this portion of the expiratory flow curve. Uh, is high because of the low resistance of the upper airways and then it, the resistance increases as we go to the medium size and then it increases further when we go to the smaller airway. So this is the importance of this portion of the curve, the descending loop that if somebody has high way, air, uh, high increase in high way, in airway resistance, uh, this curve will be, it, it's going to be changed. It's going to be changed. You have uh, here, this was a patient here, and uh, this is a normal person, for example. If you give him bronchodilator, uh, 
the flow rate, is, uh, especially at lower lung volumes, like at 50% of the vital capacity or 25% of the vital capacity or 75% of the vital capacity. If you give a bronchodilator, it's not going to change. However, if you have a patient who have asthmatic attack, you can see the peak expiratory flow is reduced. There is scooping or scooping off the curve. And uh, the peak expiratory flow is reduced. If you give a bronchodilator here, you can see the curve improve and the cooling is not there anymore. So these people, if, if after bronchodilator, the flow rate, especially in the descending side of the curve improves, then that suggests this is a reversible obstruction like, you know, during an asthmatic attack. Now, if you have a patient with uh, uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, uh, like emphysema, it is unlikely that the, the curve will change. They will not show improvement either in the flow rate here or either in FEV1 to vital capacity ratio because the damage is there and it's not going to be reversible. Now, this curve shows you, you know, compares for you the shape of the curve. This is the normal curve. Now, you can see here, this is an obstructive lung disease. The residual volume decline, the vital capacity decline, but the pattern of flow during the descending portion or at lower uh, lung volume is similar to that which observed in a normal person, but the peak expiratory flow is reduced. Now, if you take somebody who has obstructive lung diseases with air trapping, you can see that, you know, I mean, the, the, the most important thing that you have a decline in the peak expiratory flow and then you have cooling of the curve or scooping off. Look how it looks like. And uh, the, the worst effect is observed at lower lung volume when you measure the flow rate when the vital capacity or when the lung volume is about 50% of its vital capacity. That shows you the same thing. This is the flow volume or flow volume loop during tidal breathing. And this is, that's after you take full expiration, we assume that the lung volume is residual volume. You take a deep inspiration to the total lung capacity. So this volume of air between the total lung capacity and the residual volume is the vital capacity. This is the ascending limb of the expiratory loop. And this is the, the descending limb. And if you remember, we spoke about this to be effort independent, whereas this guy here, the ascending limb is effort, in, effort dependent. And again, it becomes effort independent because of the dynamic compression of the airways that occurs at lower lung volumes. And that shows you the curves. And this is an obstructive lung disease, and this is restrictive. You can see the inspiratory, the peak inspiratory flow decline in restrictive lung disease, and it may also decline in severe cases of obstructive lung diseases. But you can see here in both cases, restrictive and obstructive, the peak expiratory flow. But see the better near similar to what's in the normal, where here you have like this concave type of shape or cooling of the curve. Uh, suggesting impairment of airflow due to the increase in resistance. Now, if you take, for example, I mean, that's a complicated topic also, but I just want to give you an example. For example, if you have somebody who has a tumor in the airways, in the upper airways even, you can see how it looks like both the inspiratory loops, the big expiratory flow is reduced both during inspiration and expiration there might be also an increase in the residual volume. And uh, so if you see this better, this most likely suggests a tumor in the upper airways, okay? Or fixed obstruction like uh, tracheostenosis due to tumor or goiter or whatever, something is pressing or closing the airways. I don't know if you want to know the details of this, Maybe it's enough for you to know the, the, the changes in the care that occurs in restrictive and obstructive lung disease.
This curve shows you or compares the three different types of diseases, like this is the normal, the black one, the blue one is in the case of obstructive lung diseases. This guy with this concave shape occurs in obstructive lung diseases, and this guy occurs when you have fixed upper airway obstruction, just uh, for example. And I talked about this in the previous lecture. We said these, these volume flow loops or curves are obtained during expiration, for expiration at different efforts. This is little effort. With increasing the effort, you can increase the peak expiratory flow. And however, the flow at the descending portion of the curve, especially when you measure the flow at 50% after you exhale, 50% of the vital capacity or 75% becomes effort independent, whereas the ascending limb is effort dependent. In case of the inspiratory loop, you can see the higher the effort, the higher the peak or the, the peak inspiratory flow. So this guy is effort independent, effort, uh, effort dependent, whereas this guy in the ascending limb, it's effort dependent, and in the descending limb, it's effort dependent. The properties of the curve during expiration. I just talked about this, and the previous slide, I mentioned a few points about the properties of the flow of volume loop during inspiration. Uh, uh, flow volume loop or flow, vo uh, flow volume curves. And uh, it just I have to emphasize uh, certain terminologies like peak expiratory flow rate, which is the greatest flow rate achieved during the expiratory maneuver that occurs early on. And I said this probably the resistance there is due or it's, it's so high because the resistance is so little in the upper airways. And this portion of the curve here represents the flow rate at different lung volumes. And uh, this portion of the curve represents apparently uh, resistance in the medium sized airways. And this guy represents uh, this portion. Uh, 50 and below represent the airway resistance at uh, small size bronchioles. And that's actually what is most sensitive to airway obstruction because you see the cooling or the scooping off in this portion of the curve. It takes it instead of being straight, it, it gets like to be a concave type of shape. And this is again the residual uh, volume, total lung capacity, and this is the vital capacity. So if we breathe one liter and measure the flow, it's going to give us the peak expiratory flow rate, which is about 8 to 10 liters per second. Here, if we measure this point here, the F -E -F -F the flow rate or the, ins the instant flow rate at which 25% of the lung capacity has been exhaled. يعني بعد ما تنفسنا لتر وقسنا الفلو ريت بيكون طالع من الرئة حوالي 25% من الفيتال كباسيتي هاي اللي هي مرات بسموها V max 50 which is the flow rate at which 50% of the vital capacity has been exhaled you can see that we measure the flow rate when the volume when we have exhaled about 2 liters which is 50% of the vital capacity here because the vital capacity here is about four liters. And this point here represents the instantaneous, the instant flow rate when we have exhaled 75% or three liters of our vital capacity. This is what in your book, you can see the shape here. This is a obstructive lung disease and this is restrictive lung disease. I have discussed those, but this is in your book. In restrictive lung disease, you can see the vital capacity decreases, the residual volume decreases, and the total lung capacity decreases. The big expiratory flow decline compared to a normal person. But see, the shape of the curve mimics or the mirror image of the normal curve. Now, if you take uh, obstructive lung disease, you can see this uh, scoop, uh, this cooling or scooping off or concave shape of the curve compared to the normal. It's going like in this direction. 
and uh, this occurs in asthma bronchitis and emphysema and one difference between asthma and uh, a chronic obstructive lung disease is that if you give a bronchodilator the peak expiratory flow is, is enhanced or increased slightly and the, the scoping also tends to go away so in, 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 in if you have a chronic obstruction it's not going to be reversed by administration of a bronchodilator where if you have a reversible obstruction it's going to be reversed and i think uh, that's basically what it is uh, there are more words here about the plethysmography this is basically dependent on you know the, the they have they do it in a certain way where the person I, I mentioned this you don't have to know the details of it but but what it is you know i mean the person start to breathe when he breathes and the size of the chest changes and as a result of this the the pressure inside the book uh, changes during inspiration and expiration and they know the initial volume and they do certain measurements and from these measurements you can different things uh, like FRC or uh, you know once you measure FRC you can measure the residual volume and so on and so forth if you measure FRC through plethysmography and you measure the end residual volume you take the difference and you will be able to find the residual volume they also measure the all all lung capacities that we have described using a simple spirometry test, uh, tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, and uh, inspiratory capacity, vital capacity. Uh, however, on the top of these, you can measure FRC, which cannot be measured by a normal spirometer. And if you figure out what the FRC, and you know the residual volume, then the end, uh, end re expiratory reserve volume will be able to figure out the residual volume and once you know the residual volume and the vital capacity you will be able to calculate the total lung capacity it's more complicated more expensive and it's you know i'm sure you will learn more about it when you go to pulmonary medicine and uh, you don't have to know the details of this it is just for you to be aware of it i'm not gonna ask you and that's what basically we can measure with a plethysmography. The lung volumes that, that we cannot measure using a spirometer, like the FRC, the total lung capacity, airway resistant. And uh, that should do it. And I hope you have learned. I tried the best I can. And I hope you the best of luck. And thank you very much.